All right, we're going to get started. I'll just continue to admit folks in. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning in some locations. Thanks for joining today's uh, Fire Chat Friday um, and participating in this great effort to provide the most up-to-date information on some very hot topics that we have in our BLM Fire program. My name is Jennifer Mislivy. I'm a public affairs specialist, uh, BLM Fire at the National Interagency Fire Center. And I appreciate again, like I said, for everyone participating um, with this session. We look at having uh, three other sessions. Today is our official kickoff of these Fire Chat Fridays. Um, so want to make sure that everyone has, like I said, the most up-to-date information. Um, we'll have a uh, question and answer session after Grant talks about the topic. Um, so please hold all of your questions to during that session. Um, you can either raise your hand or put it in the chat box and we'll capture as many questions as we, as we can in those 15 minutes. With that, we wanna to get to the most important topics of those days. So I'm gonna send it over to Tammy DeFries. Tammy, go ahead. Hey, thanks, Jennifer. Uh, yes, as Jennifer said, welcome and uh, good morning, good afternoon. Yeah. And uh, it's an honor to be yeah, here. Well, beginning and end the day at the Lucas, we have a hot mic. Hot mic, if everyone could please mute their mics, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Tammy, Tim, you, you have a non-hot hot mic, Tim. <laughs> Tammy, <laughs> go ahead and start over. <laughs> All right, now let's do this. Okay, I'm Tammy DeFries, and I'm one of the two fire advisors, and I'm based out of Washington, D.C. Um, there is another fire advisor, Rob Berger, and he's based out of the Grand Junction um, office. So one of the roles of the fire advisors here in Washington, D.C., as well as in Grand Junction, is, is to ensure that the BLM fire program has a face and a voice um, in discussions um, at that senior level, um, both in D.C. as well as the headquarters um, in the western part. So, so I share with you um, just to highlight the fact that you have people here in D.C. Um, as well as the fire center, um, as well as our BLM fire leadership. Um, and in headquarters that are highly invested in the program. Um, in fact, 37 years of investment, um, that's how long I've been um, with the fire program. So it's important, these conversations are important and uh, now more than ever, uh, we have the uh, Congress has uh, the fire program in its sight. So we have a lot of work to do, but these are exciting times. So I look forward to these critical conversations um, that will lock our program into uh, a more professional, more healthy, stable, um, and make a great career for, for all of you. So it is my pleasure to actually turn the conversation over to Grant Beebe, our fire uh, assistant director, um, so that he can carry the, the great news to you. All right, over to you, Grant. Wow, no pressure. Carry the great news <laughs> on to you. That, I don't know if you rehearsed that line. Thanks, Tammy. Uh, what It's it's uh, really great for the BLM program to have somebody like Tammy there at, at Maine Interior. Um, you know, somebody with that depth of experience there talking to people who don't necessarily have that same depth of experience. So so that's a great thing about BLM. Um, Tammy mentioned everybody's got, you know, fire in, in their sights. Uh, you all know that um, the fire seasons we're having these days, I mean, we've been saying it for 20 years, but it's accelerated even over the last couple of years, right? The fire seasons of today aren't what they used to be, and uh, that's to be expected, but, um, but it's to, to an extreme. So uh, so the, it's a double-edged sword, right? People are really interested in fire. People are really leaning in, trying to support it, trying to put more resources to it. Uh, that's, the, that's one edge of the sword. The other edge of the sword is we don't control our own destiny in quite the way we used to. Um, you know, I think... A lot of us who've been around for a while. Um, and there's a hot mic out there. Don't get called out for a hot mic. That's a, that's, that's a blow to your, blow to your psyche. Um, so uh, we, we don't own our own destiny in all cases. Uh, this is the, like the bipartisan infrastructure bill or the BIL as we call it is, is a great example of it where uh, there's so much interest. There's so many resources coming to the fire program that that uh, it doesn't, they don't just pass the money off to BLM and say go do great things anymore. It's a, it's a lot more negotiation than it used to be. That's kind of the bad news. The good news is um, we have a lot of influence over it, and I think um, one of the things I've always liked about the BLM is how flat it is, and um, 
you know, I think generally there's there aren't a huge number of steps between the field and the front office, and I and I think uh, we are working overtime to try to make sure that uh, the concerns of the field make it to the top. And when somebody like OPM, the Office of Personnel Management, is talking about a fire series, that we have voices in the room that represent. Um, the, the thinking among the folks who are actually doing the job. So that's our that's our emphasis, at least. Uh, I think one thing to to think about, uh, there are a lot of workforce challenges out in front of us as a as a as a firefighting nation, right? The the 25, 30,000 wildland firefighters out there, depending on the year who are doing the job. Uh, we know that we've got compensation issues, we've got we've got workforce configuration issues, we've got uh, longevity issues, health issues, mental health issues. Um, but we've made a lot of progress over the years. Uh, we've got, you know, temporaries can get health insurance and there's probably many of you who, who can't remember the day when that wasn't an option. We've got a uh, workforce transformation that's, that's come into our normal budgets over the last couple of years that have allowed us to start converting our workforce from a largely seasonal workforce to a more permanent workforce. Uh, we know that that's not everybody's goal. We're still going to have a, a chunk of folks who want to come and, and fight fire in the summer and, and go off and do great things in the off season. But we've also heard loud and clear that people want more security. They want a, a better path to, to a permanent job. And so we've, we've successfully, as a bureau at least, made the case that that's important. I mean, I think our view is that um, this nation's got, you know, these amazing fire seasons ahead of us. We got lots of work that we need to do to try to get past global climate change and the fuels buildup we've got in the West. And it's gonna take a more permanent workforce to do that. And we wanna, we wanna, have fire management folks who stick with us long term because, uh, frankly, to help manage BLM lands, to help manage interagency partner fires, to help manage you know the fires that impact communities, uh, we need great people making great decisions at the right time. And to do that, we need people who are going to stick around. We don't want people just coming for a year or two and leaving. If they really want to make a career of it, uh, we want to support them in that choice. So that, so that's our goal is to try to make a place for people who want to stick with us and then try to convince the people who are maybe wavering that they should stick with us, stick with the mission. And by us, I mean, it could be us, it could be Forest Service, it could be it could be Fish and Wildlife Service, it could be a state partner, but I want to commit, get people to commit to the program. And then for people who want to do other things outside of fire, you know, to, to find a pathway for them to, to move up and out. Um, so that's really the goal. Part of, part of achieving that goal means that, um, you know, in our minds, at least that you could move easily from somebody like the BLM to the to the Forest Service. Uh, you could qualify, for, or maybe maybe it's better to say it the other way around. You could move from the Forest Service to the BLM. Uh, that we have the same job series, the same professional job series. You know, the 401 versus 301 kind of discussion out there. Um, that we we recruit jobs the same way. That we pay roughly the same uh, for the same sorts of jobs. So I think you see some of that emphasis in the infrastructure bill where we're trying to come up with a common fire series. The idea really in, in a lot of our heads that um, if we have a common series and we'll be doing things the same way, at least among the federal partners, and that we'll stop having people say, well, you know, look, Forest Service can do this and we can't, or they're paying more, so I'm gonna jump ship and go that direction. Um, state agencies are a whole another matter, but at least among the federal partners, we're trying to get on the same page. So, that, so at the very least people can, can move around more readily and you're not, Trying to figure out whether you're going to get qualified for the next job because you're jumping agencies so it's definitely in our minds um but but this has been a, a blm fire leadership goal for a while try to transform the workforce i mean i think we're hugely proud that congress and and administrations have recognized that they need to invest more heavily in the fire program i think to those folks who are doing the job it's it's pretty obvious right that uh, look at what's going on across especially across the west these days and we need to invest in that in that workforce um you know, I do want to shout out to a couple of people who've done some great work. You know, we've got whole standard position description libraries that have been developed. Chris Glode's on, I know, Cindy Pogue, L.J. Brown, Ashani Sloan, Marlene Eno Hendren, Brian Oxiger, L.J. Brown, a bunch of people who've been doing a lot of work from the, at least from the national level, uh, to, to help support this effort to get us all on, on better footing. I'll just say sometimes that work is invisible and thankless, but there are a lot of folks working hard to make good decisions and, and make the process easier for all of us. So, um, and there are hundreds of people that are off that list I just rattled off, but I'll get those out there at least. Uh, I think a couple couple goals that we're looking for. Um, I mentioned 401. You know, we're hoping that as we develop a fire series, and, and I'll talk about that in a second. What's going on with OPM with that? Um, that at the very least, the 401 kind of requirements that we developed um, almost a generation ago, 
uh, can be can be updated and modified. If we stick with something like 401 that has a positive education requirement, that we can update that positive education requirement so that it's not so narrowly focused on, you know, forestry degree. Um, we have been looking at IFPM and, and reconfiguring IFPM, interagency fire program management, the kind of qualifications that go with certain positions, the key positions in the in the bureaus, and trying to update that and make that more modern, make it um, not necessarily easily get easy to, easier to get the next job. But uh, at least more straightforward and more appropriate to the demands of the job. You know, 401 is a great example. We look for foresters, but the job is as much about budget or as about personnel management as as anything else. So, so we want to broaden that look, and we're hoping that the new OPM series, as it gets trotted out, reflects some of that thinking. So, um, you know, a couple couple more items of progress. Uh, you know, we know last year that. Um, it was administration priority, uh, President Biden's priority to make sure that nobody was making less than, nobody who was fighting fire was making less than 15 bucks an hour. Um, we handled that last year with a, with a maths award that went out to really everybody up to GS9. Um, that now is instituted government-wide that nobody in government is going to make less than $15 an hour. That's a good news, bad news thing. That's great. But, uh, you know, in the, in the amount of time it's taken to get that in place, uh, $15 an hour doesn't buy what it did before, right? And so we know $15 an hour is... Uh, um, paid, you know, by most fast food restaurants in most minor metropolitan areas across the country. So it's a little bit too little, too late. Uh, um, we're not stopping there as a program. I would think the infrastructure bill is is um, evidence of that. That the twenty thousand dollars or fifty percent increase in pay that's being trotted out there in the infrastructure bill um, goes goes way beyond something that that's like fifteen dollars an hour. So we'll talk about talk about what that might look like. Um, Clearly, you know, we're having a hard time filling jobs. I think all of you guys who are hiring officials know that, that um, we're not getting the lists we had in the past. Uh, I think, you know, there are a couple of things we can do there. Um, one of them is pay people better and pay people what they're worth. Another thing is to try to hire more folks so that the folks we do have on board can take a little more time off and have a little better quality of life. Um, and then the people could see that there's a path to a path to a future in the organization. So uh, all those things being worked on, um, especially the increase in capacity piece so that people are not working themselves to death uh, during the summer months, especially. Um, housing, obviously housing and facilities, a uh, whole topic unto themselves. Pay is related to it. Um, our town here in Boise, incredibly expensive housing market now. It used to be an incredibly um, bargain market. Uh, I think anybody who lives anywhere pretty much can can tell the same thing now. I mean, housing housing is just going through the roof. That's pun intended, not intended. Uh, housing is going through the roof everywhere, uh, everywhere except I think Ohio. So if you're if you're in Ohio, you're lucky. But um, but pretty much every place else, housing is incredibly expensive. And so we've got it this this fairly low pay for introductory jobs in the federal government versus uh, how it is how it is you can afford either to buy a house or to rent a house or to rent, a, rent an apartment. So those things are pretty much mutually exclusive and we're casting about trying to figure out solutions for that. So what's in the infrastructure bill particularly? You know, $20,000 um, bump in pay for places that are hard to recruit. Um, what we know today is that when we talk about places that are hard to recruit for 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 firefighters for federal firefighters um the folks who are in the negotiations and i and i say that um with a nod to the solicitors and the and the high level hr folks who are who are kind of involved with opm and talking about this kind of stuff and looking for legal authority because because i'll say that frankly i'm not in the room but i'm but i'm close to people who are so um Hard to recruit. What they're thinking is that that's going to apply broadly across wide geographic areas. So it's really hard to distinguish what's hard to recruit from what's not. And the 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 direction, at least from our agency, from the DOI, is to look broadly at that because uh, there's hardly a place in the country where people are having a good, easy time recruiting folks. So so pretty much, it's hard to recruit firefighters everywhere. So when we talk about bumping pay for people. We're not just talking about California. We're not just talking about Colorado. We're talking about the whole program. Um, hopefully that sticks, but that's where we are now. And I, you know, I guess one of our goals today is not to raise people's expectations, but that's the agency push to, to apply that broadly from Alaska to Eastern states. Uh, who gets it? Who gets the pay bump? Um, 
what the agency is pushing and what seems to be getting traction is anybody with special retirement kind of duties, not necessarily people who are covered by firefighter retirement, but people who have duties that look like firefighter retirement. So for instance, a dispatcher, logistics dispatcher, who's not in primary or secondary coverage, but whose duties look like people who do have that coverage would get the pay bump. Um, so, so pay everywhere, everywhere in the fire program and who gets it? People who are in jobs that look like they're um, covered by primary or secondary coverage in the program. And that's across Forest Service and DOI. So, you know, you look across both those, both those agencies and say, well, okay, pilots are covered here in the Forest Service. And so we'd look at pilots over here. Uh, that's, that's the thinking right now. Um, how would you pay it? So, I mean, let's talk about this for a minute. Um, what I know from, from the folks I'm talking to in the department, they're doing the back of the envelope calculations and they're saying, well, how do we pay this $20,000 $20, to everybody who meets those criteria that I just talked about? Basically, they say that the money provided in the infrastructure bill to us in the DOI, which is $120 million, would last no more than two years paying out that lump sum. So the infrastructure bill is a, it's, you know, a five-year funding stream, but it's got limits. It's got a bunch of fuels money. It's got some preparedness money. And the preparedness money that's going to this kind of salary adjustment would not last more than two years based on the criteria we're talking about. So we're trying to match up this kind of pay bump with what's actually in our permanent budget versus what's in this temporary budget. We know that Congress then, if they really are serious about this, need to fund it permanently and not just temporarily. So we can do it for a couple of years, but we can't do it permanently. And there's Jennifer and she's telling me to hurry. How do you pay it? You can do a lump sum. You can do chunks, little lumps. You can adjust base pay or you can adjust base pay permanently. Obviously our predilection would be to adjust base pay permanently and figure out how to pay it down the road. Uh, those are the options. They're still talking about those. What do we know? People are gonna get something this summer, regardless of what we do. It's gonna to come to firefighters this summer. It's gonna come according to those definitions that I talked about. And um, more than likely what we'll pick is a month somewhere in June or July when, when most people are on board and pay it at least then. Um, Jennifer, let's, this is supposed to be a chat. Do we have any questions rolling in? Um, not yet. So everyone, um, thanks Grant, appreciate that. Um, we have time for 15 minutes for um, addressing any questions. So please put them in the chat box. You can raise your hand also, and we'll try to get them addressed. Let me, I'll say, while you, oh, thanks Jennifer, while, while, people are, while people are queuing up some questions, uh, let's talk about stuff that's not in the infrastructure bill. Um, uh, we, you know, a lot of us have talked about flattening out primary versus secondary coverage and just having one kind of coverage so people can go from primary to secondary jobs and back and forth without having to, you know, reintroduce primary jobs every time they, they go in and out of the system. Portal to portal pay, it's not part of this discussion. Uh, speed to competency for quals isn't part of it. Temp time buyback, that's not part of it. Pay parity, um, housing. There's a lot of stuff, and if you guys are familiar with it, um, Tim's Act um, is out there that addresses some of these things. That's not in the infrastructure bill, but those are certainly parts of the discussion, uh, the greater workforce discussion going on out there in the in the world. All right, thanks, Jennifer. All right, we have the first question. Can you explain how it how it would work for a fire dispatcher? Uh, a fire dispatcher. So, so generally, what they're talking about is that a fire dispatcher. Those duties look like covered duties. So a fire dispatcher um, would be covered by the pay bump and that, you know, the pay bump would look like, uh, you know, just what it says, like you get a, uh, a bump of 50% of your pay rate. And we've got, we've got some HR people who can clean up the mess I'm making here. They, ideally they would get a, a bump in base pay and um, that would come to you regardless of whether you're in right now a fire covered job or not because your duties look like jobs that are fire covered, if that makes sense. We got some dispatchers who are fire covered, some that are not, but the duties look really similar. So we would cover everybody in dispatch. All right, are fire cash personnel included in this pay bump? You know, I don't know about that one. So that's, uh, it's, that's a fair question because those are the people we gave the award to in the BLM because uh, frankly, in the BLM side, we got more of those folks who are not. and. Um, the fire, we'll have, to, we'll have to have discussion. We're definitely representing the fire cash personnel as if it does fit them. 
I'll say that we've got a move to ramp up all the positions we think in the BLM should be part of a new fire series and cash personnel are right in there. We have gone super inclusive in saying, you guys are all part of the fire organization. We can't operate without a fire cash or without fire dispatch, without fire administrative support. And we're saying all those people should be part of the fire series and covered by all this stuff. Uh, thanks, Grant. On the next question, is extra pay that will be given to firefighter this summer only to be applied to GS nines and belows like it was last year? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Um, okay. We, we, you know, we, we were kind of under this uh, definition of firefighter last year, line firefighter, and so they capped it at that level. But uh, we haven't we haven't heard about that this year. All right. Um, is there any clarification on whether it will be retroactive when it when it was signed into law, the compensation increase? No, I'll leave that to the solicitors to decide. Yep. All right. Um, you talked about professional series and the broadening that scope. What what about people who come in into this line of work without secondary education, college degrees? If they stay within the educational requirements, it may leave a lot of people qualified out. Uh, yeah. So I guess we what we don't know is what OPM is saying about those jobs at say your basic AFMO or FMO who right now are in professional series and saying that. At the very least, you, you don't need a secondary degree, but you need some credits in secondary education. So, so uh, I think personally, I think there's a good chance that they're going to say that there still needs to be some kind of advanced education to get to that level. Uh, now we consider it 401, and we have a very narrow scope of the kind of classes you can take. I I have a feeling, a hunch, and and somebody on our HR staff could correct me if I'm wrong, but I have a hunch they're still going to say that to reach those kinds of levels and do those kinds of jobs, you're going to need some kind of education beyond high school. Um, does this cover fuels, GS7, 9, and 11 positions? Uh, the, for instance, the pay bump, yeah. I mean, we're looking at yep. fire management as a big holistic hole. And so, yeah, if we don't distinguish between fuels and fire. Oh. It is all fire. All right. Um, this is going to a great direction with direct and indirect votes, but we really continue to struggle through non-fire militia to support large fire IMTs. Will there be any incentives to get more IMT positions filled? Um, gosh, okay, so there's a, there's a bunch of moves afoot there. I'll say one, number one, people hope that if we can bolster, say our firefighting workforce by an extra 1,000, 1,500 folks just on the BLM side. And those are the kind of numbers we're talking about. We would create enough extra bandwidth that some of our folks who are normal firefighters could actually go off and take some of those team slots away from the militia folks. So that's one. Two, we know that we need militia folks to help us out. We need to make it easier on them to, to um, qualify positions, positions, but we also need to make sure that um, they can make, get their day jobs done. I think there's a lot of pushback from managers saying, you know what, that day job is important too. And so these people can't be disappearing for eight, nine fire assignments over the course of the summer. So that, that is a, that's an ongoing discussion out there. Um, but there's a NWCG uh, group talking about how to manage teams better, how to make sure that um, the capacity that we do have can stretch farther and how to bring more partners into the fold so that we have different militia folks than we have right now. It's not just agency folks, but it's other agencies that, that to this point haven't really been involved so much. So it's kind of all of the above kind of answer. All right, next question. If bases increase using bill funding and those fundings don't continue past the two or five years, will pay be cut later or will there be a RIF? Yeah, so one of the options is to give people, uh, well, I'm, I'm certainly not gonna say there's gonna be a RIF on, on camera because you're recording this. So, um, and RIF is reduction in force for folks who haven't been around a long time. Reduction in force means basically we need to get rid of people. And so we need to send you to do something else or fire you. Um, so that's to be avoided at all costs, obviously, because that's nothing anybody wants to face. So there's there's there are a couple of possibilities. We could start bumping people's pay, but call it temporary and say when the money runs out, then we have to bump you back down to your current pay. Nobody wants to do that. Um, you know, nobody wants to get that <laughs> as a as a benefit, and um, nobody wants to do that to their employees, right? So once we once we bump pay, we want to keep it there. Uh, so there. As you point out in the question, there isn't enough money to do that, right? We, we don't have the base funding to continue that. We could just do that and hope that Congress ponies up, or as you point out, we got to fire people. Um, that's that's a risk, right? And so there's, I know there's a lot of social media chatter about what we should do, but nobody is excited about bumping people's pay and then cutting it. And nobody's excited about 
just betting on the com that Congress funds fills the bucket, you know, three or four years from now. Now, Riff, you know, we all know that we have people quit the job, and you know, can you can you make things work by just you know slowly slowly attriting, you know, having attrition just take care of the extra folks and then bump other people's pay. Um, yeah, but then we're going to be short an extra thousand firefighters, right? Um, so so that's the problem too. This is why it's a thorny issue, and this is why people are giving it a lot of thought before they hit the the button and, and push go. All right, next question: Would the payment center be included? Payment center. They're certainly in part of our part of our fire okay. series. I think uh, there's there's a good question there about say you know administrative positions and what looks like a fire position and what doesn't. So I I don't want to promise anything, uh, and I I know payment center people and I, they work over there, right? So um, I can go talk to you, but. Uh, we, we certainly are being inclusive about what we consider to be part of the fire series. All right, thanks Grant. Uh, next question. Would there be additional duties required to firefighters to justify the pay bump? Example, like responding to medical calls, car or structure fires? Nope, that's not our job. And frankly, uh, we think the job you're doing right now deserves a pay bump that you don't need extra duties to make it to make it happen. Although if you're going to work all year, we do think that you, you're probably going to have to take on some fuels workload or some other mission workload outside of the peak fire season. We don't want folks just hanging around with nothing to do. So we're looking for those duties in the shoulder seasons. Obviously, all the fuels work that we need to do is, is a big part of that. Uh, we certainly support getting that work done. But we I think a lot of us are uncomfortable with telling people you're going to have to travel um, a whole another six months. You travel six months for fire suppression, and you got to travel for another six months doing fuels work. I think I think our goal is to have that work funded at home or close to home, so people aren't traveling all year round. That's not uh, the kind of um, support for firefighters that we see as a viable one. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question: Does that include both series of dispatchers, the 2151 specific fire dispatchers at? 0462 logistic dispatchers, fire logistics dispatchers at 2151. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was trying to describe is that the duties are the same. They're in two different series. And so we would cover them all despite one not being in the in the 6C coverage. So yes. All right. Uh, next question. Do we have advocates working for the USDA and DOI pushing for an exclusive GS scale for the fire life positions, which would bump the pay scale by $9.60 an hour. Uh, bump the pay scale by $9.60 an hour. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not familiar with that dollar amount, so I can't say for sure. I can say that um, they're talking about the fire series and matching the fire series to a different pay scale, um, but I don't know about the dollar amount. Um, that sounds pretty particular. And, and then for advocating, let me just say, uh, here's how this works. I, as a, as a government employee, can talk to Congress folk, people and say, you know what, this looks like a good idea, uh, but I can't lobby through private individuals, so I can't call up Joe Schmo and say, call Congress and tell them to do things. That's that's against the law. So um, so there, there are ways we advocate for the program. Those are direct, not um, indirect methods. So people like Grassroots Fire, for instance, who are supporting this stuff, it's great. We talk to them, but we're not, we don't lobby through organizations like that because that's improper for uh, government employees. All right, next question. <clears throat> have you have you thought about how this is um, this isn't integrated or this isn't mitigated mitigated in a proper manner to take care of the firefighters and anyone under the category? How is it going to affect in the following years to come of more losing personnel than we already have? Right. So that's what we're trying to guard against. So that if we if we go out on a limb and bump pay and then have to cut firefighters three years from now, we don't see that as a good eventuation, right? Uh, it's not a good result. And then the date, uh, OPM needs to have their work done on a fire series by May 13th, mid-May. So they are, they are under the gun right now to get something out. All right, sounds like fuel employees with secondary retirement will be included in the pay pump, in the pay bump, correct? Um, so it's the duties that we're concerned about, not whether people are covered right now. So fuels jobs are obviously, it's, it's big under the fire umbrella. So yes, fuels folks would be covered uh, by this pay bump, according to the way of thinking that, that we're seeing now, regardless of whether they were in a covered position or not, or whether they accepted fire coverage or not, right? So we're, so we're saying, do your job duties look like fire job duties? Uh, then, you're, then you're in. And I think this applies to the next question too. Will this apply to fire business and HR personnel? So um, HR is tough because HR doesn't necessarily, you know, that's not necessarily a fire position. The HR people that we have here at the fire center do exclusively fire work. Um, we have been super inclusive about, about the fire series and saying these kinds of jobs, 
support fire directly. The incident business folks is a great example. They, they without them, we, the fire program can't function, right? So um, those are considered in our minds, part of a prospective fire series. We haven't heard back from OPM yet what they think of our ideas. Um, that's the next step. All right, where do employees not in fire positions, but who maintain fire call, fire walls and engage in fire suppression every season fall into the pay pump, pay bump discussion? Uh, they don't. It's a it's your job, not your um, other duties as assigned. So if you're a range con and you go do fire, then that's that's not part of this. AA as I'm associate it says AA from structure fire degree should be given credit. Right now it's not. So an AA and fire structure should be given. I think someone just made a comment. Duly noted. Yeah. If HR can, oh, that's Jessica. If HR can assist in answering any of these questions, please feel free, <laughs> Jessica, for that. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> now they now they speak up. Yeah. Um, all right. Next one. Um, just a couple more. So I appreciate everyone's questions. Has there been any? Has there been any talk, putting the Boise and Salt Lake City metro areas into a higher local locality pay to account for rising ha housing costs? Yeah, and I saw Cindy's response. I I've been part of those housing just or the locality pay discussions and I, and, they, and they're basically based on um, pay rates in your area and housing costs aren't necessarily factored in and, and uh, it's an act of Congress to to make some things happen so it's not you would think oh housing is expensive and uh, and that's good enough but they actually look at um, at prevailing wages and it's a complicated thing so uh, at least in the Boise area there are a bunch of executives here who have been trying to make this case for a while but they're they're bumping up against how GSA makes that stuff happen so um more to come on that all right we have three more questions so I'm gonna that'll be perfect timing to close out um our session today so I'm gonna get to those um how does the pay bump coincide with inflation government contractors are adjusting bid ba bids based on the inflation currently will pay scale be available variable based on inflation too? Um, no, but okay. once you're, so for instance, I think President Biden um, is proposing a 5% pay bump next year, right? So if you, I mean, how this works is if, you're, if your base pay goes up based on this infrastructure law and we make it permanent, then you get your 5% next year or, or whatever Congress decides to do and it, it applies to your base salary. So uh, that's how inflation is factored into federal wages is annually, uh, you get a bump based on the rise in cost of living. All right, is there a hard date for a decision and or when will it be implemented? Um, yeah, the, the hard date, I think I, I, it's May, somebody could help me, it's May 13th or 15th, I'm looking at a calendar, it's probably not a weekend, maybe it's May 13th, I think OPM is supposed to be, supposed to be done. And I think we're a little bit fearful of that date because uh, we know there's a lot of work to do before May 13th. And so we're frankly a little afraid of um, that day because it's so soon. Um, we're, we're we ha I guess there's a suspicion that they may do this in stages. They may they may pick off the low hanging fruit and say, well, these you know primary jobs are easy. We'll include them in a series and we'll come back later. And we're really pushing to this big big tent that says these are all fire positions. They belong in the fire series. We're pushing for a for a total solution right off the bat so that we're not doing this in stages. And we got people's attention now, and we want to make sure that we get the answer we want uh, now if possible. All right, two more questions. With a new class, with a new classification and a new PD being written for that classification, is there any considerations for making eighteen and eights for those positions? Uh, so classification is different. Um, Cindy, help me here, but classification is different from tour, right? And uh, so eighteen and eight, um, eighteen periods on, eight off is an option I know for our career seasonals, and. Yeah, thanks, Cindy. There you are. But uh, that's not that's not tied to the that's not tied to the PD is the short answer. No, Go ahead, not, that, you can use, PDs can be used in any way that you feel appropriate. If it's an appropriate PD as a full time year round or in eighteen and eight or a seasonal. Yes. All right. Um, and last question: um, If the increase are capped at the GS nine level, then people may abandon their GS eleven jobs to convert back to nines. Nines will make more instances depending on the step or perhaps folks won't have any incentive after the GS9 level to go any higher. Are there right any- on. <laughs> Are there Right any on. Right on. Whoever that is, they need to be part of this discussion because that's yeah. absolutely true, yes. Yeah. We always there, knew that it was best to just stop at GS9 and not go any farther. I think everybody who's above that knows that already, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, the question is, has there been any discussions on applying the pay bump to higher levels to keep people moving up and filling the positions? Um, so Chris and Cindy, maybe you can help me there on, on, because I know we're looking at that border between, between pay incentives and the next grade up. How did, how does that work when you guys look at that kind of step right there? Yeah, it's a little complicated. It's a mathematical formula, kind of like what they did for the most recent GS1 through GS4s with the pay scale. They will create the pay scale in such a manner that it'll essentially start to, um, wean itself out where the 11s will make more. I mean, there's always parts of the steps of a high of a lower grade that makes more than the first initial steps of the higher grade, right? So when you look at a pay scale, uh, so they will create it in such a manner that yes, if you stay in the nine, higher steps are going to make more than the next level up, but they will start to wean it out. So like the nine, special pay scale may stop at a step five and anything beyond that, it, you have to go to the regular pay scale and you're off the special pay scale. So it's a, it's a they figured out, people that are mathematicians figure that whole thing out. Thanks, thanks Cindy. But it is a concern and that's, that's a fair yes. concern. Yep. Um, we have two questions left, I wanna to get to them. Um, so we're gonna go over probably a couple of minutes folks so just let everyone know, but I feel like we need to address these two questions um, since there's only two left. Uh, the 401 series is down the 401 series is down to the fire operations specialist PD. Fire operations technicians are doing the same work, same grade, but the FAS is 401 and the technician is 301. Is there, is there going to be a 401 included to the FAS PD? Uh, well, hopefully 401 goes away and we're talking about a fire series. And so they would both be in the new fire series uh, in short. Right. And then the last one, is there, only money given to firefighters, a pay increase for two years instead of five, because we've included all fire support personnel in the pay increase. Yeah, so it, it totally depends on how big they go with uh, who's included and the, you know how long the money lasts. Uh, I know there's a $15 million bump in this year's preparedness budget that is being held at the department to help pay for some of this stuff. So I think people are already thinking about holding back pools of pots of money to help pay for the increase and to make it last uh, until a, a full-time budget comes in and, and fills up that bucket again. All right, those were the questions. Um, and so thanks, Grant and everybody. Um, with that, we're going to close out today's uh, Fire Chat Friday. Appreciate everyone participating, um, sending in your questions, um, and uh, just overall enthusiasm to be part of these sessions as well. So um, our next session is set up for April 22nd. We're going to be talking more discussion of the bill and kind of the different parts of that and give you a little bit deeper look into that. So that day is set for April 22nd. Um, also, we are looking for other topics. If there are other things that you guys out in the field, folks out in the field feel that is important that we should cover on these Fire Chat Fridays, please, by all means, add them to the chat or send me an email. Um, and we can also include those, maybe lump them in with some other topics as well. So we definitely wanna hear from the folks in the field on what's important to you and the information that you guys need. So with that, we're going to close out today's session. Appreciate all the participation. Have a wonderful weekend and we'll see you on the next Fire Chat Friday. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer.